I just want to welcome everybody. Uh, thank you so much for joining us uh, for this artist talk with Kristen Doc Smith. Uh, my name is Brianne Dempsey. I'm the digital uh, events and marketing coordinator for the Carving on the Edge Festival. I met some of you um, at our virtual festival back in March, and so I'm really glad that we're all back together again. Um, I want to welcome you tonight and to thank you for giving us your time. Um, I'm coming to you from the territories of the Tsleil-Quiat Nation and just want to thank, you, thank them for hosting us. Um, just as we're getting settled, I popped some links in our chat box uh, and just want to welcome you to do the same, to let us know who you are, where you're joining us from, and if you don't know, there's a little link in there that'll show you uh, traditional territories and you can learn a little bit about where you come from. Um, so for tonight's event, um, anyone who has visited the Carving Shed on Chesterman Beach will be familiar with Kristen Doc Smith and his work. Uh, Kristen moved here from Norway uh, to Tofino in 2012. Uh, he trained in classical European styles of carving, focusing on Viking, medieval, Baroque, and Rococo styles. And since moving to Tofino has been learning from the master carvers of this area. Um, he's been working in the art of historical restoration and the making of high precision replicas, which informs the Stave Church. Stave, am I saying that right? Stav, Stave. Stave Kristen Church. Will, Stave Church, perfect. <laughs> Kristen will clear all this up. Um, and that's the project that he's been working on right now. Um, I can't wait to hear about it. And I'm sure everybody else is really excited too. Uh, quick note, uh, there will be a question and answer period following Kristen's talk. Um, so if you have questions, you can either just hold on to them or you can pop them in the chat box and we'll revisit them once the presentation is over. Um, but we'll allot some time and we can all have a great chat about it there. So uh, without further ado, welcome Kristen. Thank you so much for joining us and take it away. Okay, thank you um, Brian, for that introduction. Um, yeah, you almost like summed up half of my uh, my presentation there. <laughs> no, no. <laughs> uh oh. No, no. Um, yeah. Uh, thank you all for uh, for being here today uh, tonight. Uh, I'm very excited about um, yeah talking about this project that came up last year for me. Uh, it's still very much in the beginning phase, um, but um, but yeah. Uh, this is something that I've been very excited about for a long time, and uh, I know I'm happy to share it with you. Um, so let's uh, start with um, a bit more about my background here. Uh, prepared a, uh, there you go. Can everyone see this? Yeah, okay, great. Yeah, so as Brian said, I'm, my name is Kristen Doc Smith and I'm from Norway. Um, before um, I came here, I uh, worked at the Viking Ship Museum in Oslo. Um, I worked there for about four years, uh, training in a variety of, about a, uh, like the classical European uh, education in wood carving, uh, learning Viking carving, medieval carving, Baroque, Rococo, sculpture carving. Uh, I got a grant to um, go to an art school in England uh, and study sculpture there. Uh, so yeah, um, I did a, um, a variety of, of carving over there. Uh, at the museum, um, I used to, uh, well, we, the, the Viking Ship Museum was was built in in about the nine, around 1920. Uh, in 1906, they found this um, main the, the big ship here on the on the ship on the big photo, uh, the Oseberg ship. It was a funeral ship, and uh, uh, it was sitting uh, almost like outside um, until um, this museum was built and. Um, and since then, there's always been a carver present at the museum carving security copies of the old artifacts. Um, they are extremely fragile and and cannot be lent out to the museum. So um, my teacher, uh, my mentor, and, and myself, we made replicas of these items, uh, both to have as a security uh, for security purposes if something were to happen to the original, and um, and also to uh, to have to lend out to the museums, um, 
here you see uh, the Gustavsson sled. It's one of the five sleds that we have from the uh, Viking era. Um, and the uh, the carving on the right hand side here was uh, the side that I um, that I was replicating. Um, just an example of some of the work that um, that I did. Um, and again, um, in this the ship that I just mentioned, the Osberg Viking ship, um, we had we found or they found five of these animal head posts all surrounding this queen uh, or woman that was buried in the ship. Um, we don't know what they what they meant but it's believed that they served some form of spiritual function because they were all like tied down to the ship and surrounding her in, in bed. Um, and this particular head post is called the, the Academian. Uh, and there's a copy of another one that we made. So it's uh, Viking carving is extremely detailed. Um, it has all these, um, uh yeah intertwining uh, almost like serpent um creatures um a lot of them are like disjointed where you will find a head here and then there will be like a long neck leading to a body somewhere else and hands gripping holding on to uh, another um another animal and again just the detail of some of the very intricate uh um, craftsmanship that was done. Obviously, this is a this is a, a replica, but um, the original is is just as detailed. And so, for me, that this was done a thousand years ago is it, kind of mind blowing. Um, the uh, the serpent head you see up on the right here is a reconstruction of the serpent head that's on top of the Osberg Viking ship. Um, I carved that one um, to uh, um, to have so that blind people would be able to to touch and and get a sense of uh, of the carving, and it is currently displayed at the museum today. Here's another example of some of the work that I did. Um, this is obviously not Viking carving. Um, this is a uh, one of the the Madonnas that we um we have um there's not too many of them in norway uh currently um uh, they were all thrown out when the reformation came to norway and uh we converted from uh, uh catholicism to uh being a protestant country um uh this one was actually found uh in a farm several hundred or in the barn several hundred years later um and now stands at the Historical Museum in Oslo. Um, about 10 years ago, the, uh, the church uh, where this one originally stood uh, was trying to get it back. Uh, and the museum said, no, nope, um, the conditions in the church uh, is not suitable for uh, such an old sculpture, but we can help facilitate um, um, having a copy made. And so we, we actually 3D scanned the original and I gave them a huge piece of oak and, uh, and then that was routed out, uh, just sort of roughed out, but it, you know, it saved a lot of time. And from, from the scan, I was able to, um, to carve the rest. Uh, and now there's the, the copy standing in the church all gilded and, and painted. And uh, again, um, this is uh, a serpent head from um, um, from just an old old house just outside, just outside of Oslo um, when the um, in uh, in 1904 when Norway became independent from Sweden, uh, it was put a huge emphasis on like reclaiming our identity as a Viking nation. It was also at the same time where they found uh, the Viking ship that I um, that I just showed you, and so um, they started building all these old houses uh, with Viking kind of like 
a contemporary uh, Viking carving uh, from the 1906. Uh, so um, in 2012, um, I moved to the west coast of Canada. Um, I had been out here in the year before, met a woman, and uh, after a year of flying back and forth, it was time to sort of uh, take it to the next level. And uh, um, my contract with the museum was ending, so um, I said, "Okay, I'm uh, I'm happy to um, to come over." And uh, it's been a great experience. Um, uh, and continues to be, uh, you know, being out here is sort of like a, a woodcarver's mecca. Uh, I'm sure that there is just as many woodcarvers in, in Tofino as there are in all of Norway. Um, it's not a huge craft, uh, sadly, over there. But I had the uh, uh, the great pleasure of, of working with some uh, uh, wonderful carvers uh, in the area. Um, Joe Martin, Joe David, um, I've worked with Levi Martin, um, and they all taught me, uh, you know, bits and pieces of, of their heritage, and uh, it's been um, extremely fruitful, um, specifically because at the museum I was taught, you know, the art of making making these copies and and to carve really clean lines, but I was never taught and why the Vikings carved the way they did. Uh, you know, that, that is lost. You know, we can, we can, the scholars can come up with stories of, of what these things um, mean, but um, at the end of the day, you know, they're, they're theories. And um, so to be here, to listen to the stories and see how these stories are, are playing out in the artwork um, um, has been a real, real gift and, and not at least to also to learn to connect with the wood. Uh, back in Norway, uh, you know, uh, we would go to the, uh, the mill, select the wood and, uh, and start carving and, you know, Bob's your uncle. Um, but here, you know, just walking through the old growth forest, you know, seeing these old trees and connecting to the land um, that has been, um, been a real blessing. So, um, the mask, uh, I don't know if it's on, uh, I'm, the mask I'm holding, uh, that was the first mask I, I ever carved, uh, back in actually 2011. And, um, I did that with Levi, Levi Martin, uh, a wild man from the, uh, the sea mask. And then later on, I have the mask in the center. I carved with Joe Martin, no, sorry, uh, Joe David, uh, another uh, Pock Moose mask or Wild Man from the Sea. Uh, and then I later uh, tried to sort of combine my heritage with, with what I was learning here. And again, it's, uh, it's the format of the mask that Joe David taught me, combined with um, uh, serpents from the Ernest Dave Church that I will um, speak more about later. Uh, after learning to carve some masks, um, I, um, I was introduced to the canoes. And again, um, I found the canoe interesting. I felt I was very much on the journey here. And, and then to sort of put a personal touch um, to the uh, canoe sculptures um, by adding uh, Viking carving. And um, yeah. So, um, so then, as I said, uh, last year, this opportunity um, arose. Um, this is the Ernest Stave Church. Uh, it's located on the west coast of, of Norway. It is one of the 28 remaining churches uh, uh, that we call state churches uh, remaining. Um, I'll go into why we're calling them state churches. Um, it is probably the, the one that has the most uh, character. Um, 
and it was built for, uh, it was a private church uh, when it was built um, for uh, a local, uh, a local, local well, wealthy man. Um, back to the name State Church. Um, I don't know if, I don't know if I have a pointer, Brianne, uh, can I use my mouse as a cursor, as a pointer, do you know? I don't, uh, you could give it a shot. I'm not sure if that'll work, but uh, no. you might be able to. I, uh, yeah, I don't know. Okay, well, um, the state church gets its name from that you erect uh, several staves at the center and basically build outwards from that. Uh, and that's what this drawing is, um, is trying to show you, um, just so you sort of get an idea. Um, but as I said, this, um, this church uh, was a private church. Um, it was rebuilt several times. Uh, the current one was, um, was built in 11, um, 11, 1130, 1140. Um, but the ones, the portal, which um, we'll get back to is from 1070. So um, very old, um, uh, old objects here that we're talking about and, and just how it's um, weathered, uh, you know, a thousand years in, in rain and shine uh, is, uh, is pretty uh, spectacular. Um, Norway was not an isolated country back then. And this, this church had um, uh, candelabras and, and, uh, and candle holders from France. Um, some of the blue paint that was used came through the Silk Road. Um, uh, and then on top of that, like the, the craftsmanship that was put into this um, just speaks a little bit about the, uh, uh, the wealth uh, that this person uh, uh, had that commissioned this church. And here again, it's a close up of the uh, the carvings on top of the um, um, yeah poles uh, inside the church. So um, this church is owned by the, the National Trust of Norway, um, and until recently. Um, the, anyone visiting the church have been able to walk in, uh, walk up to these carvings. Um, this is, uh, is believed to be, um, this is the, the door to the old church. Um, it, it was believed that this was once facing uh, west. Um, and then later when the church was rebuilt, uh, it was it's now facing north, which is probably why it's been so well preserved, um, just uh, more protection uh, from the sun. The, um, so what they're doing now is uh, the trust uh, came up with this plan of wanting a, a copy um, of this portal made and it's not just about copying the portal, but it's also about documenting the process. Um, and that's something that I'm, you know, been really interesting, uh, really interested in. Um, um, and, and being out here has, um, um, yeah, just showed me the importance of not just uh, caretaking the, the objects, but also maintaining the, the craft uh, and the stories uh, behind it. Um, so when I heard about this project, I was like, yes, this is just a project that I, that I need to be a part of. Um, and, um, and I am today a part of uh, a team of uh, four people. Um, there was, of course, a huge uh, interest in the project. And it was 
I think first uh, they thought that it would just give it to a couple of carvers, um, but then they later decided like, no, this is a project that uh, a lot of carvers uh, should be involved in. And we are today, uh, I think it is 16, 16 carvers. So as I said, we're, we're five carvers on, uh, on my team. Um, we got the, uh, the main part, um, it's the, the left-hand side, it's the one with the big animal. Um, and if you follow like the, uh, the side up, you can see it, that there's a, there's a joint uh, on the top. So uh, that's one side, the top part is another side, then the right-hand side uh, is another one, and, and then there's a door. And uh, so this is what we will be recreating. Um, on top of that, they don't want it just being recreated with modern tools. Uh, they want it done as authentic as possible. So we've been going through old tools, uh, old archeological findings, um, and we have uh, a, blacksmith, a blacksmith with us uh, that will be um, hand forging the tools using uh, bog ore, uh, which is what they would have used for um, tools back then, trying to make this uh, as um, authentic as possible. I'll, uh, I'll show you more photos of the tools uh, later on in the slideshow. But this is the... Uh, um, this is the main portal. There's also some uh, side panels that will not be a part of the project. Uh, the original um, portal was uh, a little bit um, taller. Um, so it's actually been, uh, is lacking about 30 centimeters uh, on the bottom and 50 centimeters on the top. Uh, the current piece is 290 centimeters. So just shy of three meters and um, about uh, 40 centimeters to 50 centimeters wide, uh, just that panel that, uh, that we'll be doing. And here is a close up of, of the animal. Um, what is interesting about the, uh, um, the carving is that the Ernest Dietrich gave name to this uh, specific style of carving, uh, the Ernest uh, style. Uh, you find it both not just in, in wood carving, but also in um, on uh, in metalwork and and uh, jewelry uh, and uh, and some other uh, like painting. Um, and and here we are transitioning from. Uh, the old um, pagan way and into Christianity. And during the Viking era, um, there was a lot of um, car focus on, on serpents. And, and here it, it bridges that it goes from serpents, but it also brings in other elements like uh, the Ernest uh, the animal. And it's, it's spoken of as a lion uh, symbolizing Christ uh, that's fighting with these serpents um, that are, um, you know, the uh, the evil or the you know the, the Satan. Um, but what is what is interesting is that um, I wish I had a cursor here now, but. You can follow these um, these lines if you on my my screen it shows on the almost like top left corner. Um, there's uh, there's a flower head at the end uh, of the line. Uh, these are lilies, and again they're representing um, God. And so one um, theory uh, that the scholars uh, came up with is that. Um, the serpents in the battle with the lion Christ are like turning good. They're, they're joining the, the good side. Um, so the, um, the decoration consists of uh, these uh, S shapes, O shapes and eight uh, shapes. And 
it's getting like really, really thin. Um, the carving is about 10 centimeters or four inches deep. Um, again, really impressive uh, to know that this was done, you know, a thousand years ago. Um, when you look closely on some parts of it, you will see that they've actually drilled down um, using um, an old an old drill uh, to uh, to find the right and correct depth, uh, and then been uh, working their way down from there. In the original carving, uh, it's not. Uh, they haven't found a lot of traces of, of pencil mark. Uh, so it is believed that a lot of this is like free handedly carved. Um, and, uh, you know, there'll probably be a little bit of sketching using maybe uh, some chalk or taking a piece of metal and, uh, and yeah, basically sketching into the wood with that. But as a lot of it was probably done, done freehand. So the um, yeah the craftsmanship and the the experience that went went into this this portal uh, was was significant. Um, we don't know if it was ever painted or or gilded in some way. The uh, the original today is protected with tar, um, and um, there was actually several, several layers of tar on it. They made a, a, a cast of it years ago and had to, uh, to scrub a lot of the, the tar off. And, uh, um, but it's still, it's, it's just really well preserved. And uh, yeah, again, here you see the top of the door. Um, uh, I think I said it was five teams, but it's four because it's uh, there's four four pieces, um, and in addition to being as deep, it's also like been back carved, as you can see under the uh, the nose of one of this the serpent. This is a photo of the uh, the tree uh, that will. Um, yeah, that will become the, the copy. Uh, it is, it's a pine tree, um, grows high up in the Norwegian uh, mountainsides, slow growing, um, very much bear the same characteristics uh, to the red cedar, uh, just that it doesn't grow that big. This tree is about 400 years old and um, it's about uh, 100 centimeter in diameter and uh, 300 centimeters in, in circumference. And it's uh, it's branch free uh, for the the first ten meters, so it's um, and that was important to uh, to the trust that we would find a local um, local tree to use for this project. And so I'm guessing that this tree will be uh, be taken down uh, this coming winter uh, when it will be easier to uh, to take it out on on a snowmobile or something like that. Here is a photo of just, um, yeah, a uh, piece um, and some of the tools uh, that they're trying. So you can sort of, um, I don't know how many of your carvers, um, but you will recognize uh, a bee gouge here in the, in the center. And, and then the tool to the right there, it's sort of like a, a fish gouge or, or knife. Uh, so it's almost like a cross uh, over between between a knife and a gouge. These tools um, are copies of tools that was found in uh, Novgorod. Um, not sure how you'd pronounce that in English. It's, uh, if I'm not mistaken, it's a city in, in Russia. Um, but it was a, um, a Viking settlement uh, during the Viking era. Uh, and these tools were found there, uh, or the originals. 
And so it just shows that a um, uh, selection of, of actual tools that they they would have used. And, and we also uh, we also have uh, several tool marks on the original uh, carving uh, from B gouges to U gouges in, in different shapes and sizes. Uh, it's been straight uh, straight knives and also um, they need to have like dog legs to get down that deep and to create a flat um, bottom in the, in the relief. And this is a selection of the, the tools that the, uh, um, the blacksmith has been, been making. Uh, you see them up on the uh, top there um, alongside some modern tools to the, to the left. So um, that is um, that is the project. Let me just look through the notes and see if there's anything that I I sort of um, missed. Um, but yeah, I am uh, more than open to to receiving to receiving questions uh, and and feedback. Anyway. Yeah, that's. That's great. I, I'll just hop in here really quick and just kind of uh, direct just for a quick second. Um, if you want to pop um, your question in the chat box, you can do that. Um, you can also use the raise your hand function if you'd like to be able to ask Kristen, Kristen your question verbally. Um, and then we also have, um, Kristen, you can just keep your power, PowerPoint up there on the screen and then you can kind of reference back if that would be easier or you can take it down. Um, yeah, so why don't we open it up to some questions and just see who uh, who would like to go first to ask Kristen some questions about this project. I'll go first, <laughs> just to break the ice. Um, you had shown that huge uh, picture of the pine tree um, and I was curious how it came up a lot at the virtual festival back in March, um, but about tree selection and obviously old growth cedar and um, the state of cedar forests um, has a huge impact on uh, specifically traditional style carving, um, but all carvers out here will talk about how the state of the forest has changed and how that affects the kind of carvings that they are able to do and the kind of projects that they take on, but even just like cultural life ways and being able to pass on knowledge. Um, because you're trying to kind of reclaim um, a lot of these processes and doing it the traditional way, does tree selection have the same kind of impact or effect, I guess? Um, yes, uh, I haven't been a part of the, of the tree selection process that's been done with a local boat builder um, that, um, but yes, obviously, um, when you look at the, uh, the details, like you need to have uh, top quality wood uh, to be able to do that. And so to find a tree um, that first of all is, is big enough, um, for this project um, and, and also has the quality um, has been has been challenging uh, for them. I know that um, because we're not blessed with having uh, the, uh, as many uh, old growth trees in, in Norway. You know, it's everything has sort of been, been logged multiple times over the, the last centuries. And um, so, yeah, I know that there was there was only a few a few trees uh, that they um, that they found um, that would suit the project and and still like they'll they'll do some more testing on uh, on a couple of them before um, making the final selection. Excellent, thank you. That that answers my question. Um, we do have a question from Mike, um, and he asks, "Will you be working on your part of the project in BC?" 
no, I will be in Norway for at least a month uh, next year. Um, we have calculated that uh, our part of the project will take about a thousand hours. Um, and so I have divided into uh, our team. I have about a, a, a month uh, worth of carving and I'll be doing it there. Um, It'll probably be a couple of, of trips because in addition to to carving this, um, uh, yeah, in, in the studio over there, um, they also want us to to go to the church uh, during the summer season uh, and be a, a tourist attraction um, and, um, yeah, to be uh, available for uh, the visitors there. Uh, I should have mentioned that the Ernest Dave Church uh, was uh, got on the UNESCO's World Heritage List in 1979. Uh, so um, yeah, it's it's an important church, um, and um, yeah, they want us to be uh, available uh, for for school classes and and other uh, uh, other people that are interested. Uh, in this project to be able to come and visit. So yeah, um, carving from the, having now been carving from the carving shed and, and receiving visitors there will be a, uh, a good, <laughs> uh, a good thing to bring with me. Yeah. Good training. Yeah. Um, similar to that, we have another question, um, like how the team works together. You all like everybody's at the same site carving. You'll all be at the Ernest Stave church then. Um, yeah, so we can't all be working on it at the same time. Uh, so we'll sort of, um, we still haven't, uh, you know, discussed the flow within the group. Uh, but obviously, you know, we, we need to get our hands on the, uh, on the piece of wood. And then there will be a lot of uh, collaboration with the other teams as mm -hmm. we uh, draw on the design uh, and and make sure that these pieces can can fit together and, uh, and that everything lines up. And then we'll be taking um, turns uh, carving. Uh, yeah. Um. Okay, we've got some more questions coming through. Um, are there examples of pre-Christian Viking carvings? Oh, we have uh, lots of examples of uh, uh, like, yeah, Viking carving. Uh, the, the Viking Ship Museum um, is the home of, of the three best preserved Viking ships in the world. Uh, they were all uh, funeral ships, um, so they were loaded up with everything that the um, the person who was buried there would need for their afterlife. Um, I show the photo of the uh, the one sled here. Uh, as I said, you know, um, this is this is Viking carving, uh, and we have five of them, um, and it was wagons, there was kitchen equipment, uh, there was tapestry, and jewelry, um, and all of these are like highly uh, ornate uh, and just, yeah, spectacular uh, to watch. Uh, so yeah, and this is sort of on the side that, you know, the, um, the Viking era lasted from about 700 to year 1000, you know, give and take, and during that period of time, you know, they, they travel a lot, they uh, got different influences uh, and and the style changed. So you can, um, it goes through different uh, time periods and with specific styles and based on time, but also also the place. But yes, yeah. um, there was, there's lots of uh, excellent, uh, um, yeah, artifacts on uh, on Viking art at the museum and uh, in Norway. Very cool. Um, I'll probably just switch to uh, a question from Luke. Um, he's curious to know, he visited the Viking Museum with his daughter last year. Very impressive to be so close to those ships and various artistic components. He's curious to know how you became interested in Viking carving. Mm. 
Yeah, like I, uh, it's kind of like an interesting story. I, I was working in the military and sort of felt I had the, uh, my plans for what I wanted to, to do with my life uh, until I um, started meditating uh, and I was following this teacher. I saw that he was coming to, to Oslo and I thought, okay, this will be, be fun to participate or to be a part of. Um, so I signed up and um, during the last day at this meditation retreat, I happened to be seated next to um, this guy who was a woodcarver at the Viking Ship Museum. Wow. And I had done a little bit of carving way back as a kid with my grandpa. I, uh, and I'd done a little bit of wood turning with my dad, making some smaller chandeliers for Christmas presents for my mom. Wow. Um, but, you know, after I was eight, I sort of left all that and I was just interested in sports. Um, so then when this guy said, I, we connected and uh, he said, you know, I'm, I'm actually looking for an apprentice right now. Uh, would you be interested in, uh, uh, in coming and checking it out? And I said, sure, I'll uh, love to see your, your studio, but um, I, have my, uh, I have other plans in life. <laughs> and um, I went back to the military base, uh, which was up in the northern part of Norway. Uh, and then uh, later that year, I was back in Oslo and I thought, okay, why don't I just call the guy up, see if I can still come and visit him. And he said, of course, you know, I've been waiting for you. And uh, I walked into his studio and I was like, this, I just had this feeling like this is what I'm meant to be doing. Um, and, and that's where it started. Um, so I came across this just in the way of, complete accident that was just meant to be, I guess. Wow. Very cool. Um, we have a question from Nor uh, Maureen. I'm not sure which uh, carving she's referring to specifically, but it may apply to any of or all of them. Um, and she said, like, would the lightly carved area have been decorated in another way, such as painted? Like, were any of these carvings ever painted? Yeah. Okay. So, um, just for example, the carving I have up on the screen here right now, um, the, uh, the top, um, the original was painted, um, was it red? And the bottom was painted yellow in these uh, small like cake pieces. Mm -hmm. And uh, as you can sort of see, yeah, here you see it better. In each center there was a, a silver nail. So they, um, the Vikings definitely used uh, colors uh, on their carvings. And, and also later in the, uh, once you get into the um, medieval age, uh, they, they used a lot of color. Uh, you know, the churches were, were dark, uh, only lit with candle lights. And so to get these objects to shine, uh, bright colors were, were necessary. So, you know, it kind of looks like a piece from a Disney movie, but um, this was actually how it, how it would have been when it was new. Wow. Uh, Christian? Yes. It's, it's Maureen speaking. Um, I was specifically referring to the door, the central portion of the door, which um, just seems to have very little carving on it, but yeah. uh, do you think that might have been painted then? Yeah, well, um, from what I know, um, we don't know. Um, it might have been painted way, way back. Um, and then later that paint has been lost as it's been been tarred um, to protect it. Um, so yeah, um, I can't really say for sure if the door would have been, been painted. It, it actually, it if I could, I, I didn't quite know how to how to phrase this question in a in the chat box, but if I can ask it as we're looking at this picture, mm -hmm. uh, I it's a door, but I'm trying to figure out what part of it is op opens. Yeah. <laughs> so and, and, well, at first I thought it was the central portion that yeah. you actually threw. Yep. Yeah. 
yeah so it was a pretty narrow door uh but yeah you would this part here would would open and uh you would step in ah okay thank you for clarification <laughs> I have another question. Um, because you have you've talked about learning reconstruction and how that's a very kind of specific skill set and a very specific way of thinking about carving. Um, has that and does that and how uh, does that affect and inform then your artistic pieces? Um, I've talked to a lot of carvers who you know do cabinet making or furniture, and they often talk about how like being able to do joinery changes, you know, what kind of artistic pieces they do. So I'm just curious, boat, boats and, you know, statues and beautiful reconstructions, how that has affected your, um, even your own artistic carving. Yeah, you know, the, um, the training that I received at the museum, uh, it was, you know, really thorough and, uh, and I was put, I was put like so much emphasis on like the quality of the carving. And, you know, I feel that's definitely something that I, I want to bring, bring with me, you know, not cut any corners. Um, mm -hmm. You know, I, uh, the lines has to be good, precise, sharp. And uh, yeah, just so that every product is a real, like, uh, not just an artistic piece, but also uh, a piece that talks about the quality of craftsmanship that I that I know I can do and, and that I like to deliver. That's great. Um, and then I have one one more question, just about you had this beautiful quote um, back maybe ten minutes ago that you're not just caretaking the object, but also the process itself and um, how important that is now that you're doing something like a stave church reconstruction. Um, how has the work that you do here on the West Coast and learning from master carvers here, like how do they kind of speak to each other in the process? Yeah, you know, when I, uh, when I first started at the museum, uh, I was always, you know, uh, picturing that I, that, I would continue on there. Um, mm -hmm. But what happened during those four years that I was there was that they started to, to digitalize everything. Um, and so my, um, my mentors stopped actually carving and he started uh, scanning every object. Uh, and then um, he would work together with a photographer and he would, the photographer would take photos of the objects and they would like combine his scans with a photo and you would get this object on the computer that you could scan, like spin around like 360 and look at from every different angle. And, and, and then later on, like if you wanna make a copy, you would just send this file uh, to a CNC router or a 3D printer and you would print a new piece. And, you know, it was a bit like, it was really sad when I saw the way this was going um, because uh, sure enough, like you would get an object that was, would look very much similar to the original one, but you're losing the craft. Um, so then coming out here and, and, and seeing like how the first nation carvers are like, you know, redefining who they are, like based on, uh, on their traditions and, um, and everything it was just like really inspiring and just you know really showed me that you know there's a lot more to the craft than just just the piece you know but it is the the stories that and and the knowledge that you pass on as a carver uh, so yeah for me it's just it's clear that you know that is just as important uh to to preserve Yeah, that is amazing. I, I think this whole process has been really amazing. Um, just wanted to kind of put one more Candace out there for any other questions or comments. You can take yourself off mute if you want to ask Chris, Kristen a question in person, <laughs> um, or you could pop something in the chat box. Um, kind of give it 
quick couple seconds and if no one nope okay perfect well i mean we had a lovely hour so that's so privileged and thank you kristen so much for sharing your work and your story and introducing us to a brand new way of carving and a new carving project um before we kind of wrap up are there any places that people can learn more about the state of church pro process and project anything about your work um yeah anywhere that you would kind of send people yeah um when uh, when I do go over and start the process, I'll definitely be blogging about it. So people can go to my website, uh, kristendocksmith.com um, um, and, and read about it. Uh, if they want to look up the project right now, um, they'll just have to uh, Google the National Trust of Norway uh, or just Google UNES Stave Church. Um, it's spelled U-R-N-E-S uh, Stave Church. And um, they'll... Um, yeah, the, the church has its own website and you'll also find uh, links to the um, uh, National Trust uh, and, other, um, and other documents uh, where you can read more about the, read more about the project and the, and the visitor center that are being, being built uh, where this portal will end up. That's great. Okay, I've popped, um... The, your website and the name of that church uh, in the chat box so that people can um, just copy paste, get those, uh, get into those details and learn more about it. Um, where am I here? Okay, um, please uh, stay tuned for the recording of this talk. It'll be up on our YouTube uh, most likely early next week. Um, as you get in there and you check out, we'll stick in the description again, all of these, uh, the links to Kristen's website and the, the project. And um, so you can find out more about it there and then you can share it with your friends, anybody who didn't get to say, uh, sit in with us tonight. Um, please let us know what you thought. Uh, we would love to hear from you, social media, Instagram, Facebook, or you can hit our contact us form on our website. Um, can't wait to see you again soon. Chu, thanks, Kristen. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks for having me, and uh, thanks for for listening. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Perfect. And bye, Thank you everyone, for coming.